The House will come to order. <laughs> Prayer by the chaplain. Dear God, we come before you today with humble hearts and grateful spirits, acknowledging your sovereignty over all things. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this chamber and to serve the people of our great state. We ask for your wisdom and guidance as we begin this session. Your word tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. We pray for your guidance as we navigate the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. We ask for your protection over each member of this house, their families, and their staff. We pray for their health, safety, and well-being. May they be filled with your peace and grace as they carry out their duties. We also pray for the people of our state, the state of Minnesota, that they may be blessed with your love, mercy, and provision. May we serve them with humility and compassion. Amen. The chaplain for today is Pastor Kirk Graham from River Valley Church in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. The clerk will take the roll. Members, please answer the quorum call.
The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. <coughs> Members, please take your conversations off of the House floor. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. Journal of the House, 93rd Session, 2023, 37th day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Thursday, March 16th, 2023. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with, and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the chief clerk. <laughs> Comparison reports. A copy of this order of business is available online. If there is no objection, the motions will prevail. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail and the substitutions will be made. <laughs> reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business is on your desk and online. If there is no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. <laughs> Second reading of House Files. <clears throat> Second reading of House File number 393. Second reading. Second reading of House File number 822. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1019. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1140. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1329. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1350. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1585. Second reading. Second reading of House File 1625. Second reading. Second reading of House File 2173. Second reading. Second reading of House File 2392. Second reading. Second reading of House File 2413. Second reading. Second reading of House File 2442. Second reading. Second reading of House File 2613. Second reading. And second reading of House File 2774. Second reading. Second reading of Senate files. Second reading Senate file number 1816. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House Files 2969 through 3028. First reading House Files 2969 through 3028. <laughs> calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 156. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 156, number two on the calendar for the day, an act relating to housing, manufactured homes, the second engrossment. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Ramsey, Representative Feist, to explain House File 156. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill solves two festering problems. First, it clarifies the intent of the law that utility charges to residents are mere pass-throughs and owners, collected, uh, owners collect no more from residents than what they are billed by utilities. And I forgot to mention this relates to manufactured housing, which now this bill makes more sense. Um, the way that the current law is written and has been interpreted by courts, owners can and some do charge residents more than they owe to the public utility, the Cooperative Electrical Association, or the City Water company. Second, this bill resolves another ongoing issue by clarifying that park owners are permitted to install water meters to ensure that residents each pay for the water they use and conservation is encouraged. And to ensure fairness, if water is already included in the rent, if a park owner wants to install metering, then the resident's rent will be frozen for 15 months to ensure that the resident is not paying twice for water usage. <coughs> I want to thank all par uh, parties for working together on this common sense update to the law to ensure that utility charges are uniformly passed to residents of manufactured housing communities in an appropriate way. Uh, this bill is a really big deal. It's been in the work for decades, and I would encourage your support. Thank you. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Feist moves to amend House Law number 156, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A3. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Ramsey, Representative Feist, to explain the A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is just a technical update um, to address some typos and to make sure that we are consistent with the Senate. Is there any further discussion to the A3 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A3 Amendment, please signify by saying aye. aye. 
Those opposed, please say no. <clears throat> the motion prevails and the A3 amendment is adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House Law number 156, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Discussion to House File 156, as amended. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Norris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to Representative Feist for the excellent work she's done on this bill, bringing all the various stakeholders together. Uh, I've actually got the most manufactured housing of any house district in the state uh, in District 32B. So this is a bill that's really important to a lot of the residents in my district. There's a lot of really great owners of manufactured housing across our state, but we've been seeing some concerning national trends when it comes to uh, manufactured housing. And this bill puts in some important protections to make sure that the residents are treated fairly when it comes to utility metering. One thing that's kind of unique about manufactured housing is that the residents own the house, but they rent the land that's underneath it. Uh, so, you know, in a typical situation where you may be renting, if you're renting an apartment, you're not happy with the change in the terms uh, at that particular location. You know, you, you go out on the market, you look for a new apartment, and you maybe rent a U-Haul, get some buddies together for some pizza, and you move. But the reality is that for manufactured housing, even though we oftentimes call them mobile homes, most of them, especially if they've been in one place for a significant period of time, are not particularly mobile anymore. And so it's difficult if someone has invested a lot of time, money, and years in a particular location for them to move when there's all of a sudden a significant change in the terms of their rent or their utility billing practices. So this bill is a common sense one that the stakeholders are behind to make sure that we're, we're doing right by those residents. It's something that's going to help a lot of folks uh, in my district and a lot of folks in manufactured housing all throughout the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any further discussion? I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Ramsey, Representative Feist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and and I, I'm really excited about this bill. It's a very technical bill, but um, the stakeholders work really hard to get to this agreement. And I also want to thank the advocates who are oftentimes here a lot longer than we are, um, who worked for a very long time to get to this place. So I would encourage folks to vote yes. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on House File 156. The clerk will close the roll. There being 127 ayes and three nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 366. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File number 366, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to health care, a second engrossment. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbaje, to explain House File 366. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reproductive care is health care, and that includes abortion. House File 366, also known as the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act, protects patients and providers from the chilling effects and legal attacks we're seeing from around the country related to the access and provision of reproductive health care. We are in unprecedented legal territory regarding reproductive health care since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and with it, decades of legal precedent that had declared a constitutional right to abortion. 
Since then, neighboring states have started passing and implementing harmful laws attacking not only abortion rights, but also individual liberties and privacy more broadly. Providers now have to be concerned about the type of health care they provide and whether they will be prosecuted for giving patients the reproductive health care that they need. We are seeing laws that allow other states to reach into places like Minnesota, where abortion is legal, to prosecute doctors and patients, even, even where it's legal. The prominent example of this is Texas's SB8 law that deputizes individuals to enforce their state's six-week abortion ban, allowing anyone in the state of Texas to sue anyone who, has, who helps another person obtain an abortion, even by counseling them or providing a ride to a clinic. Other examples include states like Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, and Alabama have passed or introduced laws that criminalize abortion with penalties that can include fines, imprisonment, and or the revocation of a medical license for the abortion provider. Seeing these laws not only just introduced and passed, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing that these laws are not only introduced and passed in other states, but so far allowed to stand in the courts is shocking. These increasingly radical restrictive laws are designed to ban abortion outright. And they are not based in science, they are not based in health, and they are disrupting the legal landscape regarding rights related to health care. And as Minnesotans, we cannot sit idly by. The Reproductive Freedom Defense Act is creating strong protections for Minnesotans' own health care providers and residents against legal attacks and criminal penalties that are being imposed in abortion-restrictive states. This legislation would prevent Minnesota's courts and institutions from being hijacked and abused in service of a harmful agenda from those outside Minnesota. House File 366 ensures that the law governing the release of health records excludes out-of-state subpoenas and court orders for records when in relation to laws from other states that restrict or punish the provision, receipt, or attempted provision or receipt of reproductive health care services to patients. This ensures that disclosure laws cannot be weaponized for other states' prosecution of health care that is protected under Minnesota law. This bill also protects physicians, physicians' assistants, and nurses from disciplinary action or not receiving a license solely because they may be coming from another state that has anti-abortion laws targeting health care providers. Further, this bill protects Minnesotans from laws encouraging citizens to sue individuals for providing or helping someone obtain abortion care and allows anyone sued in another state under one of these laws to countersue in Minnesota to recover costs affiliated with that case. It also ensures that Minnesota's courts will not enforce out-of-state judgments for these types of lawsuits. In essence, this bill protects Minnesotans from prosecution by other states over what is legal in Minnesota. Doctors, nurses, and other health care providers have been engaged at every hearing in support of this policy. They have told us how they witnessed the fear and confusion introduced by these laws among their patients and their colleagues here in Minnesota, not to mention their colleagues in other states. We heard earlier from a doctor in Texas who had relocated to Minnesota after SB8 was passed because he knew that in order to help his community, he had to leave his community to practice in a place where he could provide and refer for appropriate care. And passing out on your desk, you'll see you have letters in support of this bill from various medical associations of professionals and students. Minnesota health care providers support this law, and they need us to protect they need us to act to protect them in their patients. By a wide margin, Minnesota, Minnesota voters support protecting abortion access and even more support protections for, for providers and patients around abortion. Reproductive health care is about the ability to make decisions for yourself with the consultation of your own doctor. And this bill ensures that Minnesotans can do what is legal and exercise their rights in Minnesota without threat of prosecution from other states. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House Hall number 366. Third reading. Discussion to House File 366. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. And 
Well, it's another um, big day here in Minnesota, and we've heard the, the um, rallying cries outside for this bill, um, which is very troubling um, on such a serious issue as the life and death of a child to be um, really excited to see a bill like this pass that will make abortion, that will make Minnesota a, um, a sanctuary state and a destination state, state for people wanting to come here and end their pregnancies. Reproductive care by the definitions in this bill is not health care for the unborn child. Let's make that really, really clear here. Only one person is seen as getting health care in this bill, and it certainly is not the unborn child that has taken it all into consideration. This is an extreme bill that disregards the priority of the rule of law in exchange for ensuring only the lives of wanted children are allowed to happen. Would Representative Agbaje yield for a question, Mr. Speaker? Representative Agbaje will yield to a question, Representative Scott. Mr. Speaker, Representative Agbaje, does this bill allow a Minnesota abortion provider to use telemedicine to prescribe a chemical abortion drug to a woman in a state, a woman or a girl in a state where the chemical abortion drug is outlawed? I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbadje. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Scott, for the question. So this bill, um, as long as the providers for telehealth are providing legal reproductive health care in Minnesota, they are allowed to do that under the current telehealth laws. Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Representative Igbadje, well, so folks, this isn't obviously just a, a law here that we're making for Minnesotans. We're making a law for, for other states to allow the breaking of a law in another state. And no one here is going to be held accountable for that. Would Rep Representative Igbadje um, yield to another question? Representative Igbadje will yield to another question. Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative Igbadje, um, if there's a, a, uh, an abortion provider here that doesn't exactly have a great track record, like maybe women are being injured on a fairly regular basis, would that person still be protected here um, under this law? I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbadje. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Scott. This law does not cover anyone who is uh, charged and credibly found with malpractice issues. This is only covering lawful reproductive health care in Minnesota. So if you have any malpractice or tort issues, you would not be protected. Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, members, this is a dangerous bill that makes Minnesota an outlier. Uh, an outlier. Um, it turns the rule of law on its head when, in relationship to um, our cooperation that has always taken place between other states and makes us a destination state for people to do things like bring trafficked children to the state of Minnesota to get an abortion. I don't know how people in good conscience can support that. Um, this is a bill that is going to give Minnesota a black eye in many respects. And that's sad. Members, once again, this bill is only health care for one person. That's the pregnant woman. It's not health care for the unborn child. It's the end of that child's life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion to House File 366. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, the first day we were here, January 3rd, 
uh, except for one member who wasn't here that day, uh, we all swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. He, he swore, Mr. Representative Bliss swore that oath the next day. But we all swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. I think every, the first test every one of us should apply to every piece of legislation is whether it's consistent with that oath, whether it satisfies that constitutional test. And members, this, this bill does not satisfy that test. The U.S. Constitution and its full faith and credit clause says that full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And Congress has passed a law, the Full Faith and Credit Act, that enforces that by providing that such acts, records, and judicial proceedings or copies thereof so authenticated shall have the same full faith and credit in every court within the United States and its territories and possessions as they have in the law or usage of the courts of such state from which they are taken. Members, this isn't just a dead letter. This is an important part of our constitutional fabric. The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in a majority opinion in 1998 for the US Supreme Court, said, described this as the, quote, animating purpose of the full faith and credit clause. And she quoted some earlier precedent, which said that it was to alter the status of the several states as independent foreign sovereignties, each free to ignore obligations created under the laws or by the judicial proceedings of the other, and to make them integral parts of a single nation. That's where we were before we, we, before we entered into our Constitution. We were all different, all the states were different foreign jurisdictions that could disagree, that could refuse to enforce the judgments of different um, of different states, and an integral part of our constitutional order was the full faith and credit clause that said, if you get a judgment in one state, every other state's going to honor that judgment. When we have judicial proceedings that go forward in other states, whether we agree with the law or disagree with the law, once that state has entered a judgment or done some judicial proceeding, every state honors those legal judgments. This bill is the most blatant possible violation of the full faith and credit clause of our Constitution. Section 6 and 7 in particular fly directly in the face of the full faith and credit clause and say, if you get a judgment in another state, if Minnesota, we don't like it, we're not going to enforce it. Not only are we not going to enforce it, we're going to let you countersue for that amount in another state. No state on any other issue has ever done anything like this. Minnesota never does this. It's the most blatantly unconstitutional provision possible under the Full Faith and Credit Clause, and that's the reason why the Attorney General's Office anticipates legal challenges. On page 6 of the fiscal note, the Attorney General's Office anticipates legal challenges. But they say, don't worry about it. We're going to be able to handle it. We have the staff to handle it. Well, members, six weeks ago, we were talking about the resources that are needed in the Attorney General's office to do basic public safety. And we passed out of this House more funding for the Attorney General's office to do basic public safety. What, members, we have to stop creating more make work for them by creating, passing unconstitutional laws that are going to just create more and more work. But more fundamentally, members, this is a violation of our oath and frankly, it's a sad day in the history of Minnesota. Minnesota has a proud history of standing for our constitutional union. We all stood today and pledged allegiance to one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible. Minnesota has a, has a proud history of standing for the union, standing against secessionist movements that would try to tear our union apart because of disagreements about policy issues. But today is a sad day. We're taking a step in the wrong direction as the state of Minnesota. We're prioritizing an extreme position on one particular policy issue, the most extreme abortion policy possible. And we're saying that is so important that we are striking a blow against the constitutional order. We are telling other states that even if you get a judgment in your other state, if we in the state of Minnesota don't agree with it, we're not enforcing it. But just on this one issue, because 
We believe so strongly in our most extreme abortion policy in the entire country that we are going to strike against our constitutional order. So members, for the sake of uh, the oath that we all took to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota, I urge you to vote no on House File 366. Further discussion to House File 366. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm perplexed. We heard this bill in committee, I don't know, it's probably been at least a month now. Uh, and frankly, I don't view this as an abortion bill, really. Uh, frankly, the majority has already done that. The majority has already passed the most extreme abortion laws in the entire country, really the world. We already have full access to any abortion for any reason at any point in pregnancy in the state of Minnesota. That already exists here, thanks to our, our Democrat colleagues. This bill isn't about abortion. This bill is about a respect for the rule of law, or more appropriately, a lack of respect for the rule of law. That's what this bill is. And, and frankly, I'll be honest with you, and I, and I said this to Representative Agbaje in committee, there are actually portions of this bill that I agree with. Things that happen in the state of Minnesota that are legal within the state of Minnesota, other states should not have the ability to reach into Minnesota and harm, prosecute, whatever, people who have, who have engaged in lawful activity within the, Minnesota, within the state of Minnesota. I actually agree with that. Uh, and I would agree with that on any issue. But that's not where this bill stops. This bill completely obliterates any respect for the rule of law. This bill says that if folks commit crimes in other states, if folks commit felony offenses, if they are convicted of felony offenses in other states, the state of Minnesota must disregard those offenses. The state of Minnesota must disregard a felony offense or any other conviction related to things that the Democrats really care about here. This is such a bizarre and frankly unique law. And as, as Representative Niska indicated, frankly unconstitutional. And I guess the only good news is that this bill, if it becomes law, won't stand. I guess that's the only good news here but again, we continue to fund the Attorney General's office to then defend unconstitutional laws that we pass. It seems like there is a, a better option here. That we could just choose to pass constitutional laws. We could choose to understand that the rule of law is critical. It is foundational, not just here in Minnesota, but in our country. But this bill says we don't care about that anymore. This bill says that folks who have been convicted of crimes in other states will have that all absolved here in Minnesota. It's wrong. We should be concerned about the character of people who are willing to commit crime in other states and then coming here to Minnesota to have those things absolved and they continue their lives as they would. We should be concerned about the character of those people. But instead, we're going to reward it. We are going to reward breaking the law. We are going to reward behavior that leads to felony convictions in other states. We're going to say, come to Minnesota. We'll have you. We'll take you. Folks, it's wrong. And again, abortion is already available in the state of Minnesota. This bill does not change that. 
doesn't add to it, it doesn't expand your access to abortion, does none of those things. All it does is say, is, is say that criminals in another state, you can just come to Minnesota, we'll take you. You won't be a criminal here. That's a problem, folks. In, 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 of all places, we in this body, we in this institution of lawmakers should respect the rule of law. I sure hope folks will see that. They'll understand that this is not an abortion bill, that this is a rule of law bill, and every vote on that board should be read. Further discussion to House File 366. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the author yield to a question? She will yield to Representative Quam. Does this bill allow a doctor to do a telehealth with someone in another state and prescribe an abortive? Representative Quam, going forward, please direct your questions through the presiding officer. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbaje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Quam. I believe Representative Scott asked that question. Uh, this bill doesn't change the current telehealth laws that we have, so as long as the uh, provider is providing legal health care in Minnesota, then it, it's covered. Representative Quam. Thank you. Would the author yield to a clarifying question? Representative Igbaje, will you yield to a, another question? Representative Igbaje will yield. Representative Quam. I believe I heard legal in Minnesota. So does this law allow a doctor to perform telehealth to a person in another state, and if it's legal in Minnesota, but not legal in that state, this law would still allow that? Representative Igbaje. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Quam. Again, this bill doesn't change anything in our telehealth laws. It's just still saying that the health care that is provided by a telehealth care provider, as long as it's legal in the state of Minnesota, that is covered. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Zero. I have concern because telehealth is very important to a lot of our health providers here. Sanford, Mayo, et cetera, have facilities in Minnesota and other states. It is very common to do telehealth to others not presently in the state of Minnesota. If in doing so, you break the law in that state, telehealth means you're practicing in the state of the resident and the patient. So you'd be practicing in that state even though you're sitting here in Minnesota. So you would be breaking the law, practicing medicine in another state. This law, or this bill, if it became law, would allow for that practice. But is the unintended consequence that if a state sees doctors from Minnesota breaking their law and practicing medicine in their state, because telemedicine is practicing within their state, it is very conceivable that they would not allow doctors licensed in the state of Minnesota to practice in their state because there's a history of breaking the law in their state. I would not wish that unintended consequence to come forward. I would not want to put at risk the, well, frankly, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients that live outside the state of Minnesota from getting medical care, telehealth medical care, which is very prevalent in our state. And our physicians working for a entity that has facilities across state lines then would be restricted from sending Minnesota 
personnel to those other facilities in states that border us, and that's concerning. As was stated, there are some good things in this bill. But I, one of the things we need to do is avoid bad things from happening. So this bill really needs some tweaking and fixing because I want to avoid unintended consequences and I think there are errors in this bill. Is there any further discussion to House File 366? I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise just to clarify one point that was raised in the debate that I think uh, may have gotten kind of muddled, which is this idea that somehow somebody commits a crime in another state, they flee here, and somehow this, this state uh, 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 were blocked from having, uh, in that situation, from having that person uh, face justice in the place where they committed the crime. Members, uh, pages five through eight uh, talk about extradition and repeatedly use the phrase, Acts committed in this state, services received in this state, repeatedly, over and over and over again. I can find like 12 different examples of that. And there's even, in case you're confused, a definition of in this state. In this state means an action taken while the person is physically present in this state, in Minnesota. So if you want to hand over control some other state, that's fine. This is saying that these are actions in Minnesota, that something does, somebody does something in Minnesota, and in that case, uh, these provisions apply. We're not talking about a situation, somebody committing, committing a crime in another state. Um, members, uh, we should support this bill, and we should do so based on proper information regarding it. Thank you. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brinley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think that, it, or Mr. Speaker, it's important to provide further clarification. Um, in Section 2, Subdivision 1C, if, if a physician is convicted of a crime in any jurisdiction, we will license them in Minnesota. In Subdivision 1A of Section 3, if a physician assistant is convicted in another jurisdiction of a felony. We will license them in the state of Minnesota. In section four, subdivision 1B, if a nurse is convicted in another jurisdiction of a felony, we will license them in Minnesota. I'm very clear with my words when I say them. You can, you can commit a felony crime. You can be convicted of a felony crime in another state, and Minnesota will welcome you. No consequences for that here in Minnesota. Members, we should be very concerned about that, and we should vote no. Are there any other members seeking recognition to discuss House File 366? I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I was really hoping that I wouldn't have to speak on this today, but I think it's really important to recognize that pregnant people deserve health care, regardless of what that pregnancy ends up being. And I think it's also really important to recognize that not all laws are good laws. We used to have to extradite slaves who made it to free states and send them back to slavery. That's not right. It's not right, and history wouldn't look upon that as being correct thing to do. Abortion is health care, and people deserve health care. It's a Minnesota value to provide that health care and to take care of people. It doesn't need to get more complicated than that. This is a simple issue. People deserve to be treated well. And in my state, I wanna make sure that they're welcomed with open arms to get the services and the care that they deserve and that they need. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill is quite simply about protecting activity that is legal in Minnesota against interference from other states. 
Abortion providers in Minnesota may be subject to criminal penalties from other states, and so may those who are helping individuals travel to Minnesota to receive care. And this is not theoretical. Idaho has introduced a bill to prohibit adults from transporting minors out of the state for an abortion procedure. Missouri has introduced a law that would create a private right of action against those in any state who help a Missourian attain, obtain an abortion. And Texas has passed a law allowing anyone to sue abortion providers for providing reproductive health care and are planning to make it a felony for employers to pay for their employees to seek abortion care out of state. In overturning settled precedent, establishing body autonomy that Americans had relied on for 50 years, Justice Alito said, we do not pretend to know how our political system or society will respond to today's decision over Ro rolling Roe and Casey. Well, this state and this legislature have spoken loud and clear that we support reproductive rights. Whenever the question has been put to the people in other states, they have spoken loudly that they too want reproductive freedom. But other legislatures are proposing these extreme laws that are targeting those in Minnesota and those traveling to Minnesota for care. Proje projections are that Minnesota will see a 10 to 25 percent uptick in those seeking reproductive care in our state. We can't let our health care providers in Minnesota be sued for doing their job. We must protect them against being targeted for following Minnesota law. Likewise, we must protect our Minnesota residents from being sued for offering a helping hand to an out-of-state friend or family member. We are in uncharted territory. States are passing aggressive, unprecedented laws that a year or two ago would have been considered gross abuses of the judicial system. The Supreme Court wanted states to decide on abortion access. Well, Minnesota has decided, and we will stand firm to protect those who live in our state and who follow our laws. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion, I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, point Mr. of order, Mr. Speaker. Representative Long, state your point of order. Mr. Speaker, under Rule 2.32, no member can speak more than twice on the same matter. Representative New Brindley, I am going to defer ruling on this point of order, but I hope that out of respect for our rules and for this chamber that you will keep your remarks brief. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good news, they will be brief. Um, and I did stand before the majority leader. I know that that is not customary to speak after the majority leader. Um, but I just want to be very clear. And, and we keep hearing things on the House floor, and we keep being misled about what is in this bill. We were, we were told that pregnant women deserve care. I agree. But this bill doesn't provide that. This bill does nothing to further abortion access in the state of Minnesota. Nothing. This bill is about the rule of law. So anyone who thinks that this bill is going to give greater access to abortion is just wrong. That's not what this bill does. This bill simply chooses to ignore the rule of law. I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative New Brindley yield for a question? She will yield, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative New Brindley, in your understanding and reading of this bill, would this allow a doctor like Dr. Gosnell from Philadelphia that was responsible for just abhorrent um, conditions in the clinic and who was also responsible for um, children born alive snapping their um, spinal cords and a couple of women that died under his care, would it allow him, as someone like him, to come to this state and be licensed in Minnesota and would we have to license them under this bill? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, Representative Scott, I don't know about that specific case because currently in Minnesota, at least for the time being, we do have a Born Alive Infant Act. And that is still in place, at least for now. We actually do think that infants who are born have rights. We do think that in Minnesota right now. Now I know that there is a move by the majority to eliminate that, to say that infants, even if they're born alive, have no rights. But right now they do. So I'm not sure if that specific instance would qualify, but certainly, but certainly if someone, you know, if, if an abortion was banned in the third trimester in another state, 
something that, frankly, even, even has had bipartisan support to ban third trimester abortion, even here in Minnesota. Um, those people, even if they are convicted of a felony, would absolutely be licensed, be eligible to be licensed in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and in fact, if that was the only reason they, were, they had received a felony, I think we would have to license them. We could not deny them a license even though they chose to break the law, commit a felony level crime. We would have to, we would have to license them. Representative Scott. Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative New Brindley. That was my interpretation of it too, and it, it's not so much um, which law was broken, but that they broke a law, were charged with a felony, and then could come here and be licensed. So <laughs> I know you all are buried in your computer screens and everything, but that is an astounding thing. That's really astounding that we would allow that in our state. Wow. Please vote no. Further discussion to House File 366. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. I have been reading the fiscal note um, that comes with this bill, and I found it really interesting to Representative Niska's points about the full faith and credit of the state of Minnesota. Um, the fiscal note, interestingly, does not have any dollar amount attached to it. It expects no cost for this bill to be administered in the state of Minnesota, which is kind of shocking. But they do expect there to be lawsuits, and the Attorney General's office just says the um, they will absorb it, and it will be the same amount as for what they um, experience for COVID lawsuits. And I don't know how much money the Attorney General's um, office went through during COVID to um, defend lawsuits, but that probably has a number to it. But the fiscal note doesn't have that number. The governor's office also expects that it will uh, incur about 10 hours of work for their legal team on extradition process work, and they decided to absorb that cost. Then we get to the courts, and this is where we get to Representative Nisko's uh, um, argument about the full faith and credit. It is assumed, according to the fiscal note, um, that um, a foreign judgment or a judgment from another state um, will be enacted. And it is also assumed that this bill authorizes the courts not to provide full faith and credit to foreign judgments that relate to reproductive health care as defined in this, in this bill. It is also assumed that it may interfere with the administrative process for registering foreign judgments and that it is assumed a judicial officer will be required to review those um, administrative judgments because now we are not providing full faith and credit. And it is further assumed that the bill will impact the number of motions filed to quash subpoenas. And the fiscal note recommends that it is further assumed this bill provides the authority for the court to quash subpoenas. Um, but a court rule amendment may be required as the court rule is silent on the authority of whether the courts can quash subpoenas. Members, this bill is a mess. And it is harming our ability as a state um, to function under our Constitution and under the rule of law. It assumes all these different administrative proceedings and judgments are happening, and it provides no money for enacting this bill. And I, I think it's very unconstitutional, and I, I, I'm shocked that the fiscal note says there will be no cost because the courts are incurring costs, the governor's office is incurring costs, the attorney general is incurring costs, but somehow, magically, there's no cost in this bill. I, I've never seen that before, and I just think it shows the, all the many problems with this bill, and I urge members to vote no. I recognize the member from Stearns, the Minority Leader, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And looking at this bill, as you've heard um, some of the concerns that have been brought forward, members, um, that this state would be a place that others, medical professionals, charged with felonies, could come and get licensed. There would be nothing in this bill that would prevent that. I have some other comments, but what we heard on the floor today kind of says it all. 
We heard that not all laws are good laws. This is a terrible law. House File 366 is a terrible direction for Minnesota to be going. Please vote no. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbaje. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members, for the lively debate. I think I'll just go back ahead and say that, you know, what this bill is doing is ensuring that pregnant people can get the health care that they, they deserve. It's also working to ensure that physicians and uh, health care providers who provide abortion care do not feel that they are being uh, unable to provide that care. We've heard stories from around the country where uh, people who want their children, but they have a miscarriage, and they are told that they have to wait until they are incredibly sick before they can have that, take, have that taken care of in a simple procedure. This bill also only protects those who are coming to Minnesota because the only thing that is off on their record is that they provided legal standard of care reproductive health care in the state that they're coming from. But in Minnesota, we say that abortion care is legal. And we are ensuring that we are maintaining the highest standards in our medical care. And so people who are coming to Minnesota must still maintain those standards. At the end, I just want to end with this. We are in uncharted legal territory at this time. And that is the fault of the Supreme Court. And states are doing what they can to protect themselves, to protect their residents, to protect their providers. And that is what we are doing in Minnesota today. So members, I urge you to please vote green. The clerk will take the roll on House File 366. Clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 62 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail. <clears throat> Petersburg moves that House Law number 1322 be recalled from the Committee on Ways and Means and be re-referred to the Committee on Transportation, Finance, and Policy. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg, to explain your motion. I recognize the member from Morrison, Representative Creeshot. That is the motion, Mr. Speaker. Is there any discussion? Rep I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I can explain the motion a little bit better because I support it and I would ask for everyone to support it. This relates to the uh, uh, transit safety bill that um, uh, Representative Tabke has been moving through the process. It's undergone a few changes in both our committee and in, in the Transportation Committee and in public safety. Uh, it needs uh, more work in terms of a fiscal note, which is on the way, but it belongs in transportation, and I support yep. the motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Freiburg moves that House Law number 1723 be called from the Committee on Ways and Means and be re-referred to the Committee on Elections, Finance, and Policy. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member from Hennepin, Representative Freiburg, to explain the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a bill to provide funding for the Secretary of State's office. There was a little bit of confusion about the motion uh, in the State Government Finance Committee. Initially, we moved to send it to the Elections Committee. 
Um, and then somebody said, no, wait, this should go to the Ways and Means Committee. Well, lo and behold, it turns out it should have gone to the Elections Committee. Um, so I've uh, spoken to the chairs. Well, one of them is me. Um, but anyway, I hope members will vote for it. Is there any further discussion to the motion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Smith moves that House Bill number 1922, now on the general register, be re-referred to the Committee on Economic Development, Finance and Policy. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member from Olmsted, Representative Smith, to explain your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, House file 1922 is a bill modifying membership in the Explore Minnesota Tourism Council. Uh, the chair would just like another uh, hearing and potentially add some things to the bill in economic development. Is there any discussion? I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry I wasn't able to hear the uh, Representative Smith on his reasoning for the re-referral. If you could repeat that, please. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Were you asking him to yield to a question? <laughs> Representative Kosnick? Uh, you are correct, Mr. Speaker, I, I was. I, I wasn't able to hear Representative Smith, will you yield to a question? Representative Kosnick, your question to Representative Smith. Uh, Representative Smith, I wasn't able to hear the reason why we were re-referring just due to the noise in the chamber. Could you uh, please kindly repeat that? Representative Smith. Uh, the chair wanted it back in committee so we could potentially add some other uh, things to the bill uh, pertaining to Explore Minnesota. Representative Kosnick. <clears throat> All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Feist moves that House Hall number 2251 be recalled from the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law, and be re-referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Finance, and Policy. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member from Ramsey, Representative Feist, to explain the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is a bill pertaining to children's legal services, and it would come out of the public safety budget. Um, so I have asked that it switch uh, from judiciary to public safety, and I've spoken to both chairs, and they are comfortable with this. Thank you. <clears throat> is there any further discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. <clears throat> I go moves that House Bill number 2154 be returned to its author. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member from Itasca, Representative Igo, to explain your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, I'm requesting this be returned to me. This bill was actually dropped in error uh, per another bill that we are working on right now. So this bill does not pertain to what we need to accomplish, and I'd like it returned to me. Thank you. Is there any discussion to Representative Igo's motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Announcements. I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Mr. Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10, 10 a.m. Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. Representative Long moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10, 10 a.m. Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Representative Long. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Long moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 10:10 a.m. Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023.